Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining Double Radius for today's webinar entitled LTE and CBRS Overview, Breaking Down the Complexities. My name is Chad Crossland, and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Double Radius. For those who are new to us, Double Radius is a value-added distributor of wireless network solutions, and since 2001, we've been helping our customers to build better networks. This includes service providers, integrators, telcos, MSOs, municipalities, and others. We operate out of two locations, our headquarters here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and our facility in Salt Lake City, Utah. As we start out, I'd like to explain how we've taken a different approach for this webinar. Typically, we pair up with a vendor to provide webinar content. This time, however, we'd like to talk with you directly. Our goal is to provide an overview of what we know and what we don't know about LTE and CBRS in a vendor agnostic way. We hope this approach proves to be helpful, so please let us know your thoughts afterwards. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions on the material, please enter them into the questions box. We'll be watching your questions and we'll respond to as many as we can. And at the end of the webinar, please take just a brief moment to complete the survey that will appear on your screen. Your feedback will be very much appreciated. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Caleb Nahr. Caleb is our technical services director and he's often traveling around the country to customer sites, engineering their wireless solutions. We've glad, we're glad we've got him in town today before he jumps on yet another plane tonight. So without further ado, here's Caleb. Hey everybody, my name is Caleb Nauer. Uh, anyone who's listened to me get up here and run my mouth before probably understands I've got a little bit of a southern accent, so I'm going to try and keep it not too twangy for you guys. You can understand what I'm saying. So... Let's talk about why are we are here, uh, and not just because it is a swampy August day and we're looking for an excuse to hide out inside. So we're here to discuss CBRS and LTE and other types of implementations in this band. Now, we have a big juicy 150 megahertz wide slice of the 3.5 gig band that's prime for use. It's just about ready. And it's not just your cell codes and your cable codes and stuff, but it's players like you, it's WIFs and it's Munis and there's a lot of other businesses that have access to this. Now, you know, the tech writing world has been writing about this for five years. So there's been a lot of fluffery as they uh, get paid to put words on print. But, you know, there's a lot of information out there and we definitely want to look at this and kind of break it down as a simple sort of summary or an overview and say, look, you know, we know there's been a lot, there's been so much going on for years, it's kind of hard to tell what's real and what's not. So let's break it down. Let's talk about where we are. Uh, in the very end of this, I'm going to point you to some detailed resources where I find a lot of information where I keep up to date with things. Now, you know, as we know, CBRS is a real big deal. You know, all these tech writers and everything else, the manufacturers that you're in touch with have been talking about it a lot, and it looks like this real deal is about to start happening. Now, however, before we start utilizing this band, we've got to all understand there's a whole new rule set, and there's a whole new way of doing business in this band from a tech perspective, from a regulation perspective, regulatory perspective, equipment perspective, that not everyone's used to or up to speed on. So I want to introduce you to some of these aspects. Um, we'll look at some of the acronym alphabet soup that we've got going on. There's so many acronyms. So we're going to try to break down and put in layman's terms a simplified view of what of these uh, acronyms are and why they mattered. We'll talk about CBRS, how it's being implemented, who has use and access to it. Uh, we're going to talk about LTE, mainly focusing on fixed wireless broadband deployments, um, not necessarily just with for wireless internet service providers, but other types of users in this fixed wireless uh, type rollout. Uh, we're going to look very briefly at some non-LTE uses of CBRS, which doesn't really get talked about a whole lot, so I want to brief, briefly talk about that. So, again, very general overview. There's not enough time to get into the deep complexities of everything, but like I said, I'm going to point you some detailed resources at the end, and you can take off and run from there. So, up until now, we did have some access to a section of this band. So, from 3650 to 3700 for the last several years have been able to be used under FCC Title 47 Part 90 rules, or just Part 90 is what everyone's used to. Um, this band, we generally refer to it as a 365 band, so if you've been listening or paying attention, that's what you've been hearing a lot of for years. Yeah, I'm using 365, um, and we're talking about this 50 megahertz slice that's been able to be used. Now, 
the Spectrum that we're using under Part 90 uh, was lightly licensed, and we'll put lightly around even some more air quotes here. So the way it worked is you had a national license for your business, your entity, as an NN license, um, and you would apply for that, and you would get your your IDs and stuff, and then you would register your locations that you're supposed to be doing, so on and so forth. But you couldn't really purchase a license for a geographical area or a slice of spectrum or anything like that. So you didn't own any of that. They just basically just saying you were a user of that. There was no geographical protection. There was no frequency protection or anything like that. Now, there were a lot of rules that the FCC laid out when they allowed us to start using this band. Uh, frankly, a lot of these rules uh, were not really strictly followed. Um, there was little oversight or enforcement from the feds. So, you know, it was a little bit scrambled out there for years. But, you know, in this most sort of basic extent, it was basically a, a uh, you know, type of experiment the Fed. So, you know, this band was always sort of designed in mind with a sunset period or some way to transition to something else. And we see that now as we transition over to CBRS, there's currently, there are no more new NN licenses being offered. You can transfer it between entities if you don't have one, but if you don't have one, you can't register for one. So you're going to have to transfer it. Most of these licenses expire April of next year. TBD, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then after that expires, if you're using any part of this band, it's all going to have to be Part 96 approved, the whole kit and caboodle to comply with CBRS regulations. So, what is CBRS? CBRS is Citizens Broadband Radio Service. It's what this acronym stands for. You can look this up, uh, FCC Title 47, Part 96. Uh, if you've got some insomnia problems, uh, this would be a great place to start combating that. Super exciting stuff here. So the use of this band started, you know, first discussions out of the White House started about 2010. White House basically said, look, we need a 500 megahertz check of spectrum. We need operators and these fixed wireless guys to be able to use something. And it said, NTIA, FCC, you guys come up with something. So dot, 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 2015, they codified the CBRS rules going from 3550 to 3700. So the 150 megahertz of spectrum here, we just generally call this the 3.5 band. So that official nomenclature is just sort of informally what we call it. So this 150 megahertz is the 50 megahertz from the Part 90 rules from before, plus 100 megahertz of nice, juicy, clean spectrum for the most part uh, that's right below that. Now, as part of the codification of these rules, they've made some refinements to the band. So they said, hey, you can't run a split channel. You can't run something on 3667, right? They set up 15 discrete 10 megahertz channels. Can't split them up. Have to follow the channel plan. You can combine channels, blah, blah, blah. We'll get there later. Um, 3GPP made an official LTE certified band, band 48 now. So that means that uh, LTEC standards can actually use this. We'll talk about that later. But most importantly, this use of the CBRS spectrum here in this block that they've laid out, the feds are taking a what's, what's generally referred to as a shared spectrum approach. And this is kind of unique because what this means is they're allowing licensed users to buy licenses, but they're also allowing GAA or general access, which we'll get to, uh, so you don't have to buy a license to use it. And we're also coexisting in a space where there are federal deployments, big, shiny, military, missile gun federal deployments, which we'll get to in a second. So, you know, this is kind of a unique thing. And, you know, it's a lot of this is because, honestly, you know, the spare, the, excuse me, the spectrum resources are so tight that instead of just blocking this out forever, the feds are like, look, we have to allow some sort of usage in this band. Let's take this shared spectrum approach see how it works out, and then if this succeeds and everyone plays by the rules and the system works, I think we're going to start seeing more of these types of implementations and bans in the future. Now, granted, wouldn't be the first time I was wrong. So as part of CBRS rules, they have set up a three-tiered spectrum authorization framework, uh, which is a very fancy way of showing triangle. We'll look at that here shortly. Uh, but there's basically three tiers of uses that we can use um, and deploy stuff with. Um, 
this spectrum has to be controlled by an automated frequency coordinator, which is a SAS we'll get to. There must be a sensor network implemented, which is ESC, which we'll get to. And the equipment has to be time certified. So, you know, to, to summarize the crux of what CBRS is, 3550 to 3700, 15 discrete channels, official LTE band, shared spectrum with these three different tiers of access, there's an automated frequency coordinator, sensor network to make sure that we're not screwing around with the uh, military radars, and then the gear has to be certified to run into this. So you want to talk about a 35,000 foot you know, airplane view of CBRS, that's it. Now, we're going to get into details out of what some of these acronyms is and how acronyms are, excuse me, the Southern coming out there. And uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about what these things mean for users and you in the real world. Now, the feds are not the only ones who have been solely involved in building what is going to be the implementation of systems in the CBRS band. There's two industry shared user groups that um, are working on this. Wireless Innovation Forum or Wind Forum, they've been a big part of it. They've been, you know, you get a lot of companies and government groups and everything like that in a working group together and say, look, this is how we're going to define some of these rule sets. And what this means is, is we don't have one organization just running roughshod over everyone else. This is very much a community collaborative type of deal. There's also the CBRS Alliance, and they're involved mainly in more of the technical uh, implementations of radio science, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to send you some links at the very end of this that you can go and do your own research and see all the work that these organizations are doing. But I like to point that out because these are going to be your greater sources of information, and they're also to say, hey, this is not just the federal government level. This is, you know, all these industries, all these different centers all working together to hopefully get some gear in the air and get some internet to some folks. So if we look at this sort of three-tiered access system under CMRS, we've got a little triangle here that there's 800 different implementations of this if you look online, but they're all basically showing you the same thing. You have IA or incumbent access at the top, you have your PALs, priority access licenses in the middle, and then your GAA, the general authorized access on the bottom. Now the upper levels are protected from the lower levels. So this is one reason they show this sort of uh, the triangle display here is to show you, hey, your incumbents are protected from your PALs and GAA, your PALs are protected from your GAA. It's also built in a sort of uh, triangle look, basically to show you the general idea how many users are going to be, you know, kind of a reference. So, you know, when we look at the incumbents here next, you're going to see there's not really that many. There'll be a tier of PALs, there'll be a tier of GAA below that. So let's break each of these in the individual little chunks here. So we look at the incumbents tier here. These are basically federal military types of users of this band who we shall not uh, fool with whatsoever. Now, I've always been a proponent of never inviting the man into your life. Uh, and this is a, certainly a great explanation of why, because we are protecting the military, shipborne radar systems and military ground-based radar systems from our stuff. And what we don't want to do is interfere with them because one, they have missiles, but two, this is the industry's way of saying, hey, feds, we can coexist. You know, you don't have this stuff in every single location. We can all coexist together to better serve the people living in this country to get them access. So, you know, these guys are fully protected, right? There's just nothing, there's no fighting that whatsoever. However, these sites are relatively limited in the grand scheme of things. So in that 3550 to 3650 block, you're dealing with military shipborne radar. Now, these are only going to really affect coastal regions, as you would imagine, because they're on boats. So, you know, you do have some areas in there that have to be taken into account. When we talk about ESCs, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, you do have ground radar-based systems, 3650 to 3700. There's only a handful of limited locations, okay? We're not talking massive statewide exclusion zones here. Uh, same thing with fixed satellite service, the earth stations, right? These are the same earth stations and the same quiet zones that we can't fool with, the same as we've never been able to fool with when we're on part 90. That part of things hasn't really changed. Um, so these are all protected. We, we can them. There will be no interference allowed. They will always take priority when we start talking about frequency, allocation, turn ups, so on and so forth. Now, 
Um, and we'll get to the wireless broadband service in one sec. Now, there's a lot of rules with uh, out-of-band emissions and all these other things that sort of play, and there's a lot of really sort of discrete science that goes into that to say, hey, where you can and can't deploy stuff. If you look on the wind forum, I'm going to send you some in the links on the end. There's some webinars that show a lot of pictures. And there's generally a number of pictures that you can see where the radar zones that you have to worry about from the coastal, where are your ground based radars, your satellite systems, and stuff like that. And we're going to say, hey, you know, you'll be able to look at that and say, okay, I can work here, I can't, so on and so forth. Now, kind of a gray area of a protected class right now or wireless broadband service. And what this is is basically some sites from the Part 90 implementations are being grandfathered in. Um, the info out there uh, is a little, hmm, patchy is not the right word, but there's a lot of conflicting info. I don't want to get too deep into it and lead anyone astray. But there are some of these things, you know, previous installations that are going to be a protected class, but they are going to be rolled over into general access in 2020. Asterix. Why the asterisk? Well, honestly, you know, all of this depends on when these systems are ready to turn up and when CBRS is live for us to use. Okay, because that really matters. You know, when I said the Part 90 licenses expire in April of next year. You know, yes, but there's a very good chance some of this is going to be sort of emergency extended because if CBRS isn't ready, if the SASs aren't ready, if the manufacturers aren't ready for full commercial deployment, then there's no way to really start using the stuff and there's no, you know, clean way to basically say, okay, you guys can't use this band anymore, but you have nothing to replace it with. So don't take me to court on this, but I do believe. You know, some of these deadlines for the rollover to GAA and being forced to roll from 90 to 96, you know, I think these are going to be extended, but that is TBD for sure. Now, let's look at the PAL tier, Priority Access License, okay? What, what, what this mean? What this means is there are actual licenses that you can buy. And these licenses and these users in this tier are going to be protected from interference from the lower tier, which is your GAA. These licenses are going to be based on geographical areas, and they're going to be done per county. It was going to be census tract. They changed their mind. Now it's going to be based on a county basis. Okay? This is really important because um, there's a lot of granularity as what you're going to be able to deploy to. We'll get to that here in a bit. Now, these licenses are going to be obtained from competitive bidding. So they're going to go up for bid, and you're going to be able to bid. You know, if you're a smaller tier operator, uh, if you're a WISP, uh, if you're a cable or uh, an electric co-op that's wanting to get into this type of service, you know, there's a lot of rules and everything I'll play into it, but you're going to be able to bid against these tiers with some of the bigger players. And because it's on a county sort of basis, the the, the your typical – expected buyers of these big spectrum things, your Verizons and your spectrums and stuff, you know, there's a lot of financial reasons for them not to buy up every single PAL that's available, right? Because, you know, maybe they don't want to spend this money to buy all the spectrum in this county that's in the middle of nowhere in a very rural area with only a handful of users, okay? Whereas in downtown Atlanta, Charlotte, somewhere like that, well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for those guys to build up against each other. But, you know, some of these rural areas or areas where a lot of you folks are out there living and working and deploying in right now, you know, those pals are up there and it's definitely worth a look. Don't count yourself out. Let's see how this plans out. Now, they're going to start being auctioned probably early in 2020 sometime-ish, some asterisks there too, but it is definitely coming down the pipe. Now, uh, one of the cool things about this system for us is they only have access to that 3550 to 3650 100 megahertz block. So they're not going to go into that upper 50, and there can only be seven PALs per geographic area per county. Okay, So they have access to 100 megs. They're only going to be able to use up 70 megs. What this means is there's always going to be some left over. We're going to look at this here shortly for GAA. Uh, licenses are 10 year terms. They are renewable. Um, there are performance and uses requirements. They can't buy them up and then squat on them and kick everybody out. So, the squats, there's ways around that where you can use that until they turn up, so on and so forth. There's a lot of political stuff back and forth. There's a lot of big business lawyer talk going back and forth on this. I'm not qualified to be the absolute answer, but the end result is if they're not deploying, then there will be access to some of this stuff out there.
Now let's talk about GAA, okay, general access. So general access is basically what you would be using the band, but not buying a license. So because you're not buying a license, there's no tier below. There is no specifically set forth interference protection. Now, in the process of building the frequency coordination systems with the SAS and everything, there is an, you know, there are implementations of stuff to provide coordination and coexistence rules to minimize the interference from other GAA users. You know, what is that going to look like in the end? Hopefully, in the end, everyone's going to be able to utilize the demand. Things will be coordinated where you're not walking all over the top of each other. Now, you know, how that's implemented, how that system works and is updated and goes from a, a, an early intro system to a fully mature system that you can count and rely on. You know, it's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take a ton of science, a ton of work, a ton of legislative sort of stuff. But that is the end goal is for non-licensed users to use this but have some sort of coexistence, coordination in this band to be able to use it, which is super cool. Now, GA tier can utilize the entire 150 megahertz block, you know, assuming that there's no PALs there that are in use or, of course, you know, to incumbent use, you know. You have access to the whole block, but if there's a military radar issue, you're obviously not going to be able to use that frequency block. Because there can only be seven PALs in that bottom section, and because GAA has access to that top 50, what you're going to see is there's at least 80 megahertz available for every county for GA access, which is super cool. Now, Google put out this image that everybody and their brother has copied and moved around, um, but it's a really good sort of summary view as to what the spectrum is going to look like and how it's chopped up. Okay, so the top 150 megs, you know, for the whole band, your incumbents in red here, they have primary access. Um, your earth stations, they have incumbent access, um, and you're not going to be able to kick them out. But like I said before, it is something to consider, but it's not a huge deal because there just literally aren't that many um, unless you're top of the coastal area with a lot of ship activity. Now your pals here in your yellow, you can, they're going to be able to use up to 70 megahertz between the seven pals in an area. Your GAA is always going to have at least 80 megahertz. Um, subject to incumbent activity, obviously. And then the band 48, this is just here to show you that the band 48 covers this whole thing. So if you're using LTE, you have band 48 radios, that radio is going to be able to operate in that entire space. Assuming you have the right level, blah, blah, blah. So earlier I mentioned the uh, automated frequency coordination process, and that is done by the SAS or ASAS. Uh, the SAS stands for Spectrum Access System, and what this is is an automated system that's responsible for protecting your upper tiers from interference from your lower tiers. So protecting your incumbents and feds from your, your PALs, protecting your PALs from your GAA. There's a lot of stuff that gets fed into the SAS that makes this process work. Okay, When you turn up a radio, you've got to have your location info. Um, your transmit power, your antenna stuff, all that's put in there. And it takes that into account of the terrain, an account of the sensor network for ESC, uh, an account for all this other stuff, an account for updated info from the FCC and co or sorry, peer SAS level information. There's this whole continuous sort of information process going on that's telling stations and devices, CBSDs, which we'll look at in a second, you know, you can use this frequency, this is your power, this is this, this is that. Okay, all automated. Now, this process, you know, once your radios are talking to it, it is a continuous heartbeat kind of deal. So, you know, they're always updating that. So, for instance, well, we'll get, I'll go back down that little branch in a minute. So, if you look at radios and devices using CBRS, man, these are called Citizens Broadband Radio Service Devices because we don't have enough acronyms yet. CBSD. Okay. They're only going to be able to operate when they're registered and talking to a SAS. So your APs, CPEs, ENOBs, UEs, base stations, or whatever sort of conglomeration of names you want to call your radios in the air has to be talking to the SAS in some fashion. There's a lot of different ways that happens. Direct access through a domain proxy. Um, some tiers of access don't have to talk directly to it, and it's all routed through the uh, your base station you know, so on and so forth. But no matter what, anything in that band has to be co-coordinated with your SAS in some fashion. 
Right now, there are three major sort of SaaS operators running, Federated Wireless, Google, and Comscope. Those are your primary players right now. Now, there are more in play, I think Sony and a couple of others, but these are your big three that have been really involved with this since the beginning. Um, when you're picking out a manufacturer of gear, some are going to be able to interop with all of these SaaS providers. Some are going to have certain partners for original turn up just to simplify the, the turn up process as we all get this big giant conglomeration of stuff rolling. One important consideration to take is that typically there will be some sort of monetary charge per device that coordinates with the SaaS. Basically, this super cool, fully automated, massive system has got to get paid for somehow, and it gets paid for by charging a device fee. You know what that is? It differs for providers, and is generally designed to be a very low cost type of deal. But it is something that you need to take into account when you start talking about opex, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's look at some more acronyms because those are fun. Uh, there's a couple of other considerations when you're talking about using stuff in CBRS. Um, one of these things, especially if you're near the coast that you're going to hear about a lot, is the ESC, Environmental Sensing Capability Sensors. What is this? What, what are these? What these are are sensors that are being deployed upon coastal regions to detect shipborne radar. Okay, And the idea is, is they're deployed all along the coast of the U.S., and when a ship comes in and uses a radar in that band, or uses a radar in the CBRS band, basically these sensors will detect it. It'll hit the SAS immediately and say, hey, this now frequency set is blacklisted. The stations that are operating in the affected areas will then either have to roll to another frequency or shut down. And this happens very, very quickly. Um, there's a whole set of uh, pictures you can look at in the future material or the material show at the end that shows you where these can be potential zones and stuff like that. You know, where might this be a problem? You know, anywhere around the Norfolk area, San Diego, somewhere we've got a lot, a lot of military activity that's running, um, Gulfport, things like that. You know, more rural areas along the coast, you're probably not going to see very much of this activity at all. So if you're in these coastal regions, don't immediately count it out, but certainly take into consideration is this is something that needs to be, you know, considered with, and you need to know what that effect could be. Something else that's new using these bands that we haven't really seen much of before is a CPI or Certified Professional Installer Clause. Not clause, but rule set okay what does this mean what this means is that if you're installing cbrs gear for a number of devices a good percentage of pretty much anything we're going to be using in our market space a certified professional installer who has taken official training maintains certifications maintains public and private keys for uh, digital signature access has to be the one that punches in all the information that the radio then communicates to the SAS. Okay, now this is going to be a little bit of a hassle, as you can well imagine, but it's not that huge of a deal. Okay, it's mainly been required because there had to be some sort of way to say, look, there's a lot of information here. We need some sort of official certification that you know you're doing it the right way, you're keeping up with standards, so on and so forth, because this whole SAS system is definitely a garbage in, garbage out type of scenario. And the reality of it is, if you throw a bunch of stuff up there and you put a bunch of garbage data in there and you get found out or you interfere with ground-based radar or ship radar, because you said you're here, but you're not, and your accuracy levels are off, you are going to be in very big trouble. And you do not want to be in trouble with the feds because they will knock you out, and it is very, very bad. So let's all be good, okay? So there's a lot of requirements. Um, Federated Google Com Search, or sorry, Comscope, they have their own programs and certification processes. They all follow the same standards. 
it does not necessarily have to be the person that installs the radio. And I think that's a real common sort of confusion point. So you don't have to take your entire installation crew or your contractors that you do this with or your temp guys that are doing this and have everyone certified. A certified person has to put in this information, but it doesn't have to be an employee. It could be a contractor that comes in and does this for you. You could outsource this to a different company and they, they do all this for you. So it's gonna take a little coordination, but it does not have to be everyone on staff. And that's a really important consideration. Now, when we talk about devices that are required to have CPI installation, um, you're looking at your CBSDs that are either Category A, Category B, or EUDs. Your Category A devices are going to be running on the lower power levels. And these are generally devices that are at, outside, generally less than six meters above the average terrain. Uh, if they do not have geolocation print, uh, uh, capabilities to say, hey, I'm here and this is my altitude, it will require CPI um, because someone has to put this information in manually. Your higher power devices, which is a majority of what we're using in the fixed wireless space, you know, your big APs and your CPs outside. These are higher power devices, typically above, six meters above the average terrain. These will have to have a CPI required. EUDs, your end user devices, these do not have a CPI requirement, but these are generally things you don't install per se. So uh, this is your indoor stuff, so your mobile, your uh, phones and things like that, your DASs for that, uh, various sensors and stuff, because they're generally very low power and they're generally indoors and low range, they do not have a CPI requirement. So if you're gonna be deploying, this is something you need to be looking at now. If you want to be deploying, TBRS equipment in the very near future, when it goes live, you need to get some sort of plan in place right now to get your, your, your certified professional installer set up. So if we get a look at kind of the big picture of how all this stuff ties together in CBRS when we start putting gear out in the air, okay? What you can see is uh, ComSearch has made us a lovely little diagram here. Well, you see in the core of this is your SAS, okay? That's handling all this coordination. You'll see the SAS is talking to the FCC, but it's also talking to the peer SAS. So your ComSearch and your uh, Google and your Federated, these SASs have to be able to communicate and share information back and forth. Your SAS is also gonna be talking to your ESC core, which are your sensor network deployed along the coast because they need to have the ability to wrap the changes your small cell deployments, your fixed wireless deployments, your in-building, your downs and stuff like that, your macro, your fixed deployments, these are all communicating through the SAS in some sort of method, either direct access or via some sort of domain proxy, which a lot of the manufacturers are implementing in our space, some sort of process to handle that. So in the end, gear goes to work, gear has to talk to the SAS. Now, you'll see there's a lot of moving parts right here. And that makes the timeline on this a little slippery. So we talk about CBRS, you know, everyone's big deal or big question is with CBRS. I'm like, all right, man, yeah, that's real cool, bro. Uh, when can we start deploying? When can we buy gear, put it in the air? That answer is soon. <laughs> the always present soon. Hadn't, hadn't any day now. So we've got a lot of things that have been done on the ESC stuff. We'll talk about in a sec ready to roll just about, but you know, the main scroll linchpin to see does all this stuff actually work together in some sort of fashion is gonna be tied in your ICD or initial commercial deployment, okay? This is the giant go, no go on this whole system. What this is is the manufacturers and the SaaS operators, the FCC um, select users are working together to get all these things together, all these moving parts and see can they deploy does the stuff work? Does the SAS communicate? The radios pick the right things. Is the terrain working? So on and so forth. Now, ICD is supposed to start, as of right now, September of this year. So next month, ICD is supposed to start. It's gonna take at least 30 days if things go well. Um, realistically, there'll probably be a little bit of slide there. But that is the current go, no go gate on this whole kit and caboodle, okay, is this ICD. So hopefully very soon. Full commercial service, ICD goes saying we're looking at the end of this year. Uh, the SC network, that was a big sort of major gate. Uh, a lot of stuff is progress very recently with that. Um, 
the sensors have been certified, the FCC coverage plans are in process, and they're deploying now. So that was always a big linchpin, but, you know, it seems like that sort of part's moving well. So hopefully the rest of this is going to start hitting traction. Now, what can you do while you're waiting for all this? Well, you know, you can deploy, you know, if you're legally using Part 90, with legal Part 90 stuff, you can keep using it now. And you need to work on some sort of migration plan. There's stuff out there that already has a full migration plan in place. A lot of your LTE manufacturers and some others. There's stuff out there that's not there. So there's a ton of 90 stuff that your your older WiMAX systems and your older proprietary systems and stuff like that are not 96 certified. So there needs to be a transition plan in place very, very, very soon because it is going to go away. So stay legal. Do smart things. So that's basically a general overview and summary of CBRS and what we're dealing with there. Let's talk a bit about LTE now. So, you know, everyone who has a smartphone generally knows what LTE is. Uh, this is buzzword central, man. So LTE, LTE, LTE. And that's where a lot of discussion on CBRS from these tech writers and stuff comes from because you're focusing on a lot of big boy operators, your cell companies, your cable companies, your big equipment manufacturers that are making your big iron LTE stuff for these players. Uh, there's tons of discussions about in-building and mobility. Uh, there's a ton of fluffery. Like if anyone remembers WiMAX when it was going to be 70 miles and 70 megs and everything else, right? There aren't quite that levels of pure BS hype, but it's getting there. There's definitely some hyping happening. So let's, uh, we want to be realistic. But like I said, you know, this sort of stuff is not really the focus of us and our market. We're being fixed, focused on fixed wireless broadband deployments. Why do we want to use LTE in these type of deployments? So LTE, as everyone knows, stands for long-term evolution. This is a global standard um, developed by the 3GPP that is used all over the world, right? And there's tons of iterations. There's years in history and evolutionary changes and generations of all this stuff. But it is a general global standard for wireless communications. And that's a big deal. We're using LTE in these areas. So, and there's some other things we'll talk about in a sec. Yeah, but. Deployment with this market for line of sight and urban deployments. And this is why you see a lot of this. You know, if you have an open area, you got a lot of density, you got clean line of sight. You know, there's a lot of these unlicensed systems that are going to be easier to pull in and less expensive, but very crowded, very polluted, a lot of noise. So, you know, there is no one single tool in the toolbox in, in, in the world. If there was, there would just be a giant easy button and we'd run this place with like three people and just have one thing. So, you know, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox and there's a lot of different ways. You know, these sort of big iron systems cost a tremendous amount of money to use in these Selco markets and stuff like that. They're not feasible for a lot of these WIS markets and a lot of these rural markets just because you don't have the density, you're never going to pay for it. Um, there's also, you know, some of that real sort of LTE magic we don't have access to. Fully licensed systems with super high ERP levels and stuff like that, you know, hasn't been an option lately. Now, CBRS is opening up a lot of these sort of things for us, though. Uh, it's giving us higher ERP levels when we had on port 90, port 90, part 90. Um, the coordinated licensing and access systems with spared spec, shared spectrum, you know, you get a PAL in an area, that's your spectrum for 10 years. And you use it right, then it's yours to use, you can renew it. You know, that's as close as a fully licensed system as we're probably ever going to get. 
Uh, there's professional installation deployment enforcement now, which means that you know some of these deployments aren't going to be nearly as wild west as things were in the past. So when we're looking at these types of deployments, we have to look at the benefits and considerations of using LTE for these markets. Um, benefits obviously increase foliage penetration. Like I said, access to clean frequencies, you know, 150 megahertz, a lot of clean spectrum to be used, especially when it's used in a licensed and or coordinated process. Um, the gear uses worldwide standards. You know, the LTE from one manufacturer to the next is built on the same core. And in a perfect world, you would have full interop. Now, that's always not necessarily true. Sometimes they put custom hooks on stuff. But, you know, your things that your manufacturers are using, you know, uh, carrier aggregation, multi-user MIMO, you know, these sort of parts that play into the LTE standards, they're all using this in some fashion. Uh, there's a lot of scaling options. You know, this is built, and LTE systems are built for really large scales and higher number of systems, which, as you grow your operation, is a very important source of benefit. Now, consideration-wise, you know, the con side of things, perhaps, if you want to call it that, you need to look at your CapEx and your OpEx. What is it going to cost to deploy? What is it going to cost to keep running? Uh, what's your cost going to be per user from the SaaS, so on and so forth? Uh, there's a pretty heavy learning uh, your networks aren't going to run the way that you think they are. You have to do different things with your routing, your IP addressing, your at AAA. You know, none of this is, is that hard, but it's different than a lot of operators are used to dealing with. So, you know, you need to make sure that you're getting a good partnership with your vendors and that you're taking the training and stuff to get fully up to speed there. In terms of acronyms, we've already kind of gotten into that. There's a whole other full set with LTE, just, you know, adds a little bit to the learning curve. Uh, and again, like I said, because your, your network sets and stuff like that are set up differently, there's a sort of a whole full system approach. You know, you can't just throw up a leg and be like, oh, I'm just doing this over here and blending in with everything else. There's a lot more to consider when you're doing these deployments. But this also means it's kind of a pro, too, because it also forces you to build these things with scaling and stuff in mind and how you're going to continue to build. Then, of course, the Debbie Downer side of things, as I'm uh, somehow known for around the office for I have no idea why, is that it's not magic. And, you know, I tell people this not to be negative, but to say, hey, you need to do your research and have realistic expectations of what this is and what you're going to do and not fall prey to the hype train. Because tech writers love a hype train and uh, unscrupulous vendors love a hype train because they'll sell you a bunch of stuff and it's not going to do what it needs to do. Now. Manufacturers in this market that we deal with, not going to do that. They're cool folks, you know. So there's a number that are doing LTE in our space. Uh, just in alphabetical order here, we've got Airspan, which recently bought Mimosa. So they're familiar with the fixed wireless industry. They've been in the LTE market for a while. Buy sales, they've got a whole North American team that they've spun up uh, here in the States and that know what it takes to run LTE in the U.S., great group of folks. Blink Networks has recently come on to the market. I'm very exciting things that they're doing. Cambium, had, uh, they actually do have an LTE system in play um, that they'll be doing soon. Mm, there might be a couple more others in that soon, but it is coming at some point here in the future uh, with the Ranger system. Uh, Telrad, Telrad's been a global player for a long time. So, you know, all these folks are been in this industry. They know what it takes to do LT here in the States, and they are fully up to date on everything CBRS for sure. A lot of them have, uh, you know, they've all got staff that have been in the industry, the WISP industry specifically, for a long time. There's a lot of veterans there that have been doing this. So, great group of folks. The roadmaps between manufacturers are going to vary, so you got to talk to them, right? Again, because it's a standard-based system, you are going to be able to compare and contrast stuff, which is really important because it's kind of harder to do sometimes with proprietary systems. So, Keep that in mind. And of course, the sales reps here at Double Radius, you know, they've been selling these systems for a year. This should be your first point of contact where stuff they don't know, they're going to get you in touch with one of these manufacturers to get things figured out. And then last but not least here at the tail end of this, because I'm sure you're tired of hearing me ramble about, um, I do want to point out that CBRS usage is not just for LTE. So the standards were built as kind of technology neutral. There's a bunch of rules about this, that, and the other, and requirements for type certification, so on and so forth. But the CBRS rules do not say it has to be LTE. LTE is a primary focus. CBRS Alliance is focusing on LTE for sure, but you know there are other types of gears that can be used there. One example that just popped up early August, um, Cambium Networks got their 3 gigahertz PMP 450 platform certified as Part 96. Uh, really cool. So 
I expect to see other manufacturers here in the near term that are running on sort of proprietary built from the ground systems to start appearing in this space well. Now, you're not going to see chipsets, you're not going to see sort of standards AC stuff rolled over to CBRS. It's not going to happen like you saw in part 90. It's just, it's never going to work like that. But, you know, things built from the ground up from a bunch of different manufacturers have the potential to use this band, and that's great because competition is a great thing. Now, you're going to have to compare and contrast. You're going to have to do a lot of homework here to understand the technology types and understand where things are going to do better and worse or, you know, for any given target. You got to look at your foliage penetration, deployment time, capex, opex, interference mitigation. You know, these are all things to take into consideration. So, you know, this is basically to say LT is cool, uh, works really well, a lot of different options, but there are also options that are not LT that need to be taken into account in your tools and toolbox approach. So, now kind of wrapping up here, um, resources section here that we're going to put up. So, this is where I've gotten a lot of this information is where you can stay up to date on what's going on in the CBRS world right now. So the Wind Forum and the CBRS Alliance that I talked about, here's their primary sites. Uh, Wind Forum's got the CBRS status summary page, which is kind of keeps everybody up to date as to here's the official, this is where we are. Uh, you can go to their webinar section. They've got a ton of uh, webinars up there for over the years, you see how the history has progressed with CBRS. This is where you're going to find some of these explanations about your exclusion zones and your charts and stuff like that. Uh, Comscope, we've got some uh, some things up there. They have their CPI um, site here where you can learn about being a professional installer. They've also got another sort of summary, the CBRS 101 in 25 minutes. That's a good sort of presentation. Another view and an explanation of how this is. Uh, WISPA. WISPA is a major resource for this sort of stuff. Go to WISPA.org. Uh, if you go to WISPA Palooza coming up uh, in Vegas or you go to WISPA America next year in the spring, you know, all those manufacturers I mentioned earlier, they're all going to be there with some sort of presence and they're all going to be able to talk about CBRS. It's a real big deal in our industry now and you're going to find out all you need to know as to what's going on. Uh, also, a special word for Richard Bernhardt. Uh, he's been involved with WISPA and WinForum for a long time. He has got an excellent way of being able to explain things in ways that you know the tech folks can understand, but the business folks can understand. He's been a primary driver behind a lot of the sort of you know general research that we throw people's way. So, um, great resource there. And then, of course, we have a blog going on. We partnered with the Buy Cells to put up a blog and summary and some access uh, about different things that are going on with CBRS. So you can follow that link there. You can get to it from our general blog site. Real good source of information there. And that is all I've got. So Jeff or Chan, if you got anything you want to filter back my way, or we can skedaddle. Yeah, I think we've been able to uh, answer some specific questions that have come in through the chat. Um, if you have specific questions that you would like to ask of us, uh, have Caleb even get back to you, you can uh, send us an email, sales at doubleradius.com. Uh, if you are, if you have a sales rep with Double Radius, contact them. Otherwise, uh, sales at doubleradius.com will get to us. If uh, if you'd like to call us, you can find all of our contact information on our homepage at www.doubleradius.com. Other than that, um, we will have a recording of this presentation if you'd like to review it. That will be up in the next day or two. And other than that, thank you for attending today, and we hope to see you the next time uh, we have a webinar coming up in September. The next topic will be on eBand. So look forward to hearing from you then. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.